Okay, well, let's, uh, let's begin. Well, first uh, and foremost, greeting from the Warburg Institute online channel. And welcome to this season last session of Renaissance Lives, which today is really about uh, women's life and more precisely, early modern uh, women's struggle. Uh, it centers on Mary Gara book, Artemisia Gentileschi and Feminism in Early Modern Europe, of which you can see the, the table of content on the screen. I am very privileged, therefore, to be joined by two distinguished art historians, the author, Mary Gara, who is Emerita Professor of Art History at the American University and is recognized as one of the founders of feminist art and has written extensively on Artemisia. And her main interlocutor, no less distinguished, is Beverly Lewis Brown, currently a senior research fellow at the Warburg Institute and a distinguished art historian who has authored books and important exhibitions, including Renaissance, Venice and the North and the Genius of Rome with the birth of Baroque painting. And without further ado, Beverly, if you want to start the first question. Um. Well, welcome to everyone. I am where it looks like Francois is tonight in very hot Florence, uh, a city that was uh, really, and one might want to say the birth of uh, Artemisia's artistic career. And Mary um, is by every single way that you want to look at it, the doyen of Artemisia Gentileschi studies. In 1989, she published um, the first really major book on Artemisia, and since then has published other books, countless articles, and has seen an incredible explosion by other people in, as she once put it in a, in a lecture, uh, Artemisia is coming out of the woodwork. Uh, ex every time a museum buys one, then you get a new Artemisia exhibition. And so I really want to know, Mary, um, when, why, uh, were you compelled after all this time to write yet another book on Artemisia? And how do you take into consideration this flood of new information and new interpretations since you're really a pioneering book? Well, um, the, why a third book? Let's uh, start with that. Uh, my first book, as you say, was the first scholarly book on Artemisia. Um, and it was very much fueled by the, the feminist perspective that my generation of women brought to, to scholarship. Um, it was widely recognized as groundbreaking and did break ground, but there was a kind of persistent critical current uh, in the reviews that I might have imposed feminist ideas anachronistically upon this 17th century artist. Um, so that was in the back of my mind always. Um, along with what I was learning more and more about Artemisia, um, there was a lot of scholarship coming along, um, of course, on her. Uh, just to start with, in, in exhibitions, of course, the, uh, the exhibition in Florence in 1991, Artemisia, uh, uh, curated by Roberto Contini and Gianni Papi, uh, was, of course, a very important uh, first milestone in ex the exhibition world. Uh, it would be followed later by the monumental exhibition at the, at the, um, the Met in New York in St. Louis on Artem Orazio and Artemisia Gentileschi, curated by Judy Mann and, and Keith Christensen, and other exhibitions followed. Uh, in the scholarly realm, there was, of course, the most important uh, publication yet, uh, Ward Bissell's uh, Catalogue Raisonné of Artemisia, which had been in preparation for a long time, but he, he hadn't gotten it really finished uh, before my book came out. And he actually published it in um, 1999, I believe it was. And it was a very important uh, resource for all of us, uh, a kind of touchstone for individual works and attributions and uh, misattributions and, and all that. Um, my own second book was a, a short in-depth, that was 2001, short in-depth study of two different paintings, each of which presented attribution or interpretation problems, and each of which complicated our sense of Artemisia's artistic identity. Uh, at that time, uh, her identity, uh, who she was as an artist, was being defined in radically different ways, uh, which I wanted to address in that book. Um, meanwhile, scholarship on Artemisia, and uh, of course, different interpretations figure into this, uh, included new, new monographs on her, uh, first Jesse Locker's book, 
uh, on Artemisia and uh, followed by Sheila Barker's, the most recent book, Sheila Barker's Artemisia monograph, um, each of which are uh, quite important contributions and each of which brings our, our knowledge and our understanding uh, several steps further. So the third book, um, I really hadn't intended to write another book on Artemisia at all, but when Michael Lehmann invited me to contribute to the Renaissance Live series, I took it as a chance to explore Artemisia's relationship to the feminist writers of her time. And here's where another thing that had happened in the intervening three decades uh, comes in. Um, in that period, scholars had uncovered and published a lot of writers, uh, women writers, uh, in the early modern period that we uh, never imagined uh, ever existed in many cases, or certainly didn't know their works well. Uh, this was uh, published, and uh, these were published in an important series called The Other Voice in Early Modern Europe, edited by Albert Rabel and Margaret King. So I was able to, I wrote the book, it's just a short, relatively short book, and I, I built, it was built really on uh, the scholarship, you know, I drew in all the scholarship that had, on Artemisia that had been uh, done in the interim between now and then my first book. And, but most importantly, I was able to demonstrate there was, there was what we today call a feminist movement in Artemisia's time. And to reiterate uh, what I had it sort of instinctively understood more at, at early days, that her art should really be seen in that context. The, um, one of the things and, and the word that you just used, and I know that <clears throat> one of the very interesting things about the book is um, bringing in all of these female voices that we did not necessarily know about before. And, but the word feminism is really a modern uh, notion and not a word that Artemisia herself would have known or would have used. Um, so why or how do you think that that term or that idea of feminism would have been expressed in the 17th century? And what kind of terminology do these women writers that you cover use? Well, of course, they never used the word feminism. Uh, it wasn't uh, even invented really as a word before the 19th century, I don't believe. Um, and feminism, nevertheless, ne existed before we knew what to call it. Um, an analogy that I've often made, and I, I'll repeat now, is that it's it's very similar to the situation with science. Science was called natural philosophy um, up until, I don't know what, the 18th century, maybe, in, in 19th. Uh, but Galileo and Newton belong to the history of science. We don't call them natural philosophers. We call them part of the history of science. So feminism, similarly, was something that perhaps didn't have a name. Uh, women would uh, speak of injustice to women, of uh, all kinds of things about women, but uh, had the excellence, the nobility of women, the importance of women, the uh, cruelty to women, all those things, but they didn't have the word feminism in their vocabulary. Uh, but the name matters because feminism is now assigned to a period of political action, and that didn't really happen until the 18th century. Uh, its theoretical, what I would call its theoretical phase, began much earlier in the early modern period, starting with Christine de Pizan's uh, book on the City of Ladies. Um, so we really need to see this as a continuum that evolved over time, uh, a larger phenomenon of history itself. And I think in, in particular that that's important because Part of feminism's history has always been backlash against it. There's always a social tide working to erase memory and forget, so that Betty Friedan in the 1950s could speak of the problem that has no name. Even then it had no name, but there was a long history that preceded what she recognized in society. The, um, how do you want to, or maybe we should look at some pictures by Artemisia and see how you want to apply that term uh, in terms of her own painting. Sure, um, we're, we're going to be looking at um, images um, somewhat in the order of the sequence of chapters um, uh, in, in the book. Uh, and so it's convenient because this is a, in part the way this images are set up, it's convenient for me to just start right in with chapter two. Um, and I, I, Francois, I think we've got, but well, that's fine if you want to do a detail of the image either way, but we'll look at the whole thing too, perhaps first. 
Um, the second chapter, the first chapter of the book is a long chapter of kind of I call it Artemisia and the writers, and I really talk about the historic relationships among um, possible, possible ones between people. Uh, chapter two starts in with a sequence of chapters, begins the sequence of chapters that is each devoted to a particular issue or uh, problem that feminist writers acknowledged and talked about in their time. Um, chapter two is uh, about sexual sexuality and sexual violence in particular. It's a chapter that deals with issues that cut to the bone for early modern women as they still do today. Um, <clears throat> and the, the chapter focuses on two of Artemisia's earliest compositions, uh, the biblical heroines, Susanna, we're not looking at her, but Lucretia, um, both of whom were um, threatened, Susanna was threatened by of rape, to be raped by the, the elders if they didn't succumb to her. And Lucretia, of course, was obliged to succumb to rape. Uh, both of these stories involve chastity, a woman's primary virtue in that period, because it was essential to prove to a husband she hadn't had relations, sexual relations with other men. Uh, at stake there was the legitimacy of offspring. So um, what the feminist writers recognized very early on was um, the double standard that adultery was a crime for both sexes, actually, but only for women was it punishable by death. Um, men's domination over women was assumed, their own sexual freedom was a given. Uh, this issue, as I say, was a key issue for many of the feminist writers. I'm going to name a couple of them now, two or three of them, just to get uh, us into the uh, writing of the, and thinking of the period, and then we'll come back and talk about the painting. Um, Moderata, excuse me, Moderata Fonte's dialogue, The Worth of Women, uh, a very important key work of the later 16th century. She actually predated Artemisia a little bit and they couldn't have known each other. Um, it, uh, it's a dialogue in which women are, are sort of uh, gathered in an imaginary garden where they discuss the issues that were on their table as, as women for what was wrong with their society uh, in this patriarchal society. And they offer very subtle philosophical arguments, actually, against the injustices to women. It's worth reading if, if one doesn't know it for the uh, relevance of the issues still today. Um, so she, she was talking, that women were talking about the, the double standard uh, in that dialogue. Uh, Lucrezia Marinella, another important writer at the time, and the nun Arcangela Tarabotti, both Venetian contemporaries of Artemisia. Um, Marinella, who wrote a, a treatise called The Nobility and Excellence of Women, uh, challenged the most misogynist treatise of her time. That was a, a work uh, by Giuseppe Passi called The Idoneschi Difetti, the defects of women. And Marinella systematically uh, refutes his catalogs of women's defects. Um, and Tara, Arcangela Tarabotti, who had been uh, for, forcibly cloistered by her father, uh, bore down on the double standard with anger and passion. She was very uh, outspoken, even from the convent. Now, we come to Artemisia's Lucretia. Um, th this painting, by the way, is either an original work by Artemisia, the first version of, by her of uh, about 1612 or 13, at 12, that is to say, just after the rape trial of 1612, or a prob other some people think it may be a replica of that work painted as late as uh, 1620 or so. But in either case, it, uh, it preserves, it's a composition that dates from shortly after Artemisia's own experience uh, and uh, the issue of rape. Um, of course, the story, uh, I won't tell it in detail, but Lucretia was raped by a kinsman of her husband, the king, the Etruscan king of Rome, and therefore threatened by that act with shame and disgrace. So she tells her husband and father that she declares no unchaste woman shall live through her example. Mr. Livy gives us that story, and she stabs herself to death. Uh, Lucretia's de choice of death to defend a principle, patriarchal principle, led Ro the Romans to replace uh, in the story, that is, the monarchy with a republic, hence the Roman Republic, and thus Lucretia became a symbol of political freedom, both in Renaissance Italy and in the French Revolution. Well, feminists saw it otherwise. Beginning with Christine de Pizan, whose uh, book of the City of Ladies published, written in the early 15th century, around 1401, um, she describes the story of Lucretia as a terrible personal problem for Lucretia a really drastic situation where no choice is really without penalty. She can't do anything right to save herself. Um, Artemisia too focuses on 
Lucretia's terrible decision. Uh, we see the figure seated in a, a bedroom space, a, a allusion to the rape that has occurred. The disarray of clothing indicates what has happened. She looks upward, gazes upward, is it? And she holds the dagger upright. That This is, I must emphasize, very, very different from the more typical presentation of Lucretia dutifully plunging the knife into her breast, stoic resignation. Uh, this Lucretia is questioning the need to kill herself, it would seem. She looks upward, she gazes upward, the knotted brow, the tense uh, holding of both one and one breast, which has significance too, and the knife upright, it in, so implies that she's questioning the necessity of the act itself, maybe in demanding an answer from God or her male contemporaries, you might imagine. Um, so she's, uh, Ar Artemisia, giving us Lucretia as an ex existential dilemma, if you like. How could she be put in this situation in which she will be damnably blamed unless she's willing to die? Uh, so Artemisia Lucretia protests with anger, uh, and that uh, echoed to me other feminist writers of the period, Laura Cerreta, Laura Cerreta in particular, 15th century humanist and feminist, who wrote about some insult uh, from, final insult from a man degrading women. I'm just going to quote this because it gives you some, something of the spirit of the, Luke, Artemisia's painting. Laura Cerreta writes, I am angry and my disgust overflows. Why should the condition of our sex be shamed by your little attacks? My mind, thirsting for revenge, is set afire. Red hot anger lays bare a heart and mind, long muzzled by silence. Uh, significantly, Artemisia's Lucretia, Lucretia has a, an open mouth as if she is speaking uh, against the kind of uh, cultural um, uh, prohibition against women's speech, which is another subject in itself, but we see a speaking uh, voice. So uh, those are some of the points I really wanted to bring out, but I, I'm certainly, uh, we can talk about the painting and we're using it to stand for, for others, of course, but these are the issues that I, I wanted to uh, high, highlight and foreground in, in the chapter. If, of course, when we look at um, Lucretia, one almost inevitably <clears throat> brings up the subject of Artemisia's own rape and whether or not the way in which Lucretia is portrayed has anything to do with her own uh, personal experience, um, which well, yeah, go ahead. But I would also um, sort of point out that one of the things that is very, very different uh, to this than any other paintings of Lucretia at the time or beforehand that, that I know is this sense of her squeezing her breast, almost as if she's going to give it to a child mm -hmm. or um, that sort of offering it up in a way that one generally doesn't see in uh, images of Lucretia. Yeah, that was a very public puzzling feature to me too at first. And I, um, she's actually palpitating the breast in a gesture that's quite familiar from uh, images of nursing mothers. And so I thought, well, first question to me when I was writing for the first time about this in, back in 1989 is, well, why in the world is she doing that? And at the time, I um, concluded that she was probably bringing into play the ongoing cycle of birth and death. You know, life goes on, the possibility that Lucretia's life might go on, and she might uh, participate in the, the process of, of giving birth and keeping the human race going, as opposed to killing herself to defend some patriarchal value. Um, I, and I think that generally, you know, sort of answers the question of why she brings that in. I, I will mention it without going into it, that I've just recently done a, a study of uh, what I call Artemisia Gentileschi and the metaphoric female breast. Um, and I think for reasons I'm not going to explain, but I certainly could, uh, that Artemisia in several of her early paintings is, seems to be using the female breast as a metaphor for her own artistic creativity, um, analogous to the way the penis functioned in that culture for, to symbolize male virility and creativity all in one package. And uh, it's not, it, it, it comes into play here, perhaps not so self-consciously, but she is posing her own creative potential as an artist. After all, she didn't know when she was uh, after the rape and the trial, which humiliated her in many ways wrongly, 
And then she was married off to a Florentine, which presumably to ex be expected to produce and reproduce, which she did. Uh, but she didn't know to the extent that when she painted this painting, she didn't really know to what extent uh, she would be able to continue her artistic career. And so it may be that she is uh, bringing herself her own crisis of identity into play here as well uh, through this kind of allusion to her creative potential, which could include for Artemisia and did both her creative and her procreative potential. It, I don't know it, about the future work, but that, that I think is really one of the reasons we see that kind of uh, that, that unusual uh, detail of the, of the focused breast. One of, one of the things that's interesting that you just brought up and maybe should lead us into some other painting is this sense of self-identity in yeah. her work and how much of the uh, females that you see in paintings are in fact self-portraits, uh, quite obviously self-portraits, and how much of them might be sort of metaphorical portraits like the Lucretia, which may mm -hmm. not look as much like the uh, painting, say for instance, that the National Gallery uh, in London just uh, bought or the one that the Getty bought, which look much more like actual, but, Artemisia taking on a very um, physical role of the woman being portrayed by using herself as the model. Yes, and I think you make the distinction very nicely between uh, works that are uh, rather rather obviously self-portraits and really meant to be uh, understood that way, such as the uh, recently discovered St. Catherine of Alexandria now in the National Gallery of London, um, and uh, the uh, work closely related to it, uh, the lute player in um, Hartford now. Um, and we, these works are, of course, very much linked by their uh, juxtaposition of the sequence in which they were painted and their relation to a third picture, the Uffizi uh, portrait uh, image of St. Catherine, uh, not necessarily a self-portrait, but they're all linked with Artemisia. And indeed, she, um, she in these works, she puts herself forth front and center as the um, subject of the composition. Other works like the Lucretia and others, uh, she's in it, but she's not meant to uh, show herself as a self-portrait. She doesn't mean for you to uh, recognize her except by extension, perhaps. So there are these differences. Um, but um, the, the, you, you kind of lead me, if you don't mind, unless you want to discuss this particular mm -hmm. position further. Uh, it does lead me to the subject of the third chapter, which I call the fictive self, uh, because that ch uh, that chapter is is really about uh, women's uh, involvement with women writers and Artemisia, uh, involvement in role play. Uh, it's a, a case in which uh, early modern women turn their handicap into creative opportunity. Um, Artemisia depicted herself as Saint Catherine of Alexandria, a saint. She depicts herself as a woman dressed up in a fine silk gown playing a lute, which, by the way, she's never known to have done, um, not known as a musician, and wearing a turban decorated with gold filigree, a very fine dress, and this rather provocative display of highlighted breasts. And perhaps for some, a somewhat seductive gaze, given the musical context, um, which led some people, uh, myself included, to wonder why she presented herself this way when she had so recently endured the scandal of the rape trial and something that was something, by the way, that was distinctly downplayed in her new role in service to the Florentine Medici court. Um, and the answer to that was directly linked to that court, of course, because following the rape trial, as I mentioned earlier, she was married off, so to speak, to a Florentine, spent almost a decade in Florence <clears throat> where she really launched her career. Her principal, one, one of her principal patrons, who was another, uh, but this, this particular set were the Medici Grand Duke Cosimo Secondo de Medici and his Austrian wife, Maria Maddalena. Uh, uh, Mad Maria Maddalena's tastes and interests in particular were expressed in the court ballets and performances that she commissioned. And I need to mention here that after Cosimo's uh, death in 1620, Maria Maddalena and her mother-in-law, uh, the Grand Duke's mother, uh, Christina of Lorraine, ruled Tuscany as, as a, um, a regency, in effect, with such conspicuous support of women that it has been called a gynocratic court. Two books on the subject uh, um, 
Kelly Harness in particular. Um, well, Artemisia, let, let's go to, uh, uh, if you can go to the lute player now, I'd rather just come back to that one. Uh, in 1615, Artemisia is likely to have participated in one of the Grand Duchess's performances, the Ballo delle Zingare, or the Ballet of the Gypsy Women, written by Francesca Caccini, uh, the important early modern woman musician who was at that court as well. Uh, so this theatrical image, uh, rather theatrical image, uh, may relate to that performance. Uh, Artemisia's uh, participation uh, is uh, only surmised. There was mention of a certain Artemisia, a description of a certain Artemisia who performed that night in the ballet. There were a couple of other Artemisias at the court, but I think the image helps to reinforce the probability that it was our Artemisia who did perform as a gypsy. Well, the turban uh, has a kind of uh, gypsy association uh, in general in art of this period. It also has associations with um, uh, Sibyls and um, as well with uh, artists, because as I write in the book, I think it's the first time I've said this, pointed it out, the turban, uh, artists wearing a turban uh, is a sign, clear sign of an artist as it was for Michelangelo. Buonarroti uh, drawing, uh, showing him in his turban housed at Casa Buonarroti, where she was also doing work in this period, so she was well aware of the signifier of the turban as an artist. So she's identifying herself to complicate her identity in the painting by associating herself with gypsies, with musical performers, with um, perhaps uh, seductive ones as well, um, and with artists. Um, and she went further with her multiple associations. While at the court, she also depicted herself as an Amazon, the painting is lost, and as St. Catherine of Alexandria, as you saw in the other painting. Uh, so in, it seemed to me that in presenting herself in multiple roles, Artemisia may have found a way to, be, to escape being pinned down to one identity, which was the sexualized woman, the so-called loose woman that had been imposed on her, her really by the rape trial in terms of the gossip and the uh, sort of slander that, was, that surrounded her unfairly there. But she wasn't unique in uh, playing roles and in, in, in putting out more than one identity of herself. The Grand Duchess herself, Maria Maddalena, presented herself in a variety of roles. She identified uh, strongly with Maria Ma Ma Mary Magdalene, her namesake saint, and she commissioned a lot of paintings and dramas about the Magdalene and other virgin saints, by the way, apparently in the belief that virgin, uh, the right, correct belief that virginity would somehow legitimize uh, a woman's exercise of power. She wasn't actually a virgin, she had children, but that was, you know, a kind of symbolic virginity, you might say. But uh, my, uh, Grand, the Grand Duchess also identified herself with as an Amazonian huntress, a uh, commission from Artemisia, a painting, painting of Diana and her nymphs, which probably for her, for, for the Grand Duchess, was a kind of Amazonian reference, the, the idea of an Amazonian community. At Diana, uh, Artemis, Artemis in antiquity, was associated with the Amazons uh, in kind of mythological lore. And so that may have been why she commissioned it. So she uh, was playing the virginity stereotype against the uh, huntress, the Amazon stereotype, uh, to escape the es essentialist typecasting that so frequently constricted women, virgin or whore, so to, so to speak. Uh, and even Francesca Caccini uh, played roles in her musical compositions, and I, I think we don't have time to go into that, but I talk about these in, in the, the book and the creative uh, use of fictive cells by Artemisia, by her patron, Maria Maddalena, and by her colleague at the court, uh, Francesca Caccini. One of the um, other interesting things that I think you probably bring out in the next chapter in the book uh, is about the political association of these women. It's not just uh, Amazons in a, in a ruling sort of sense, uh, but that they could take on in Judith a very political way of looking at um, things as well. Okay. Uh, yes, indeed. That the chapter uh, on the Judith chapter is very much focused on the issue of women's political power through the lens of the biblical heroine Judith, who figures, as you know, quite importantly in our religious era. Um, 
the issue of women's political power was one of the central issues in, in early modern uh, writings, women's writings. Um, and Judith's associate, excuse me, assassination of the tyrant Holofernes was very much a political act since it saved her, her people, Judith saved her people, the Israelites, uh, with this assassination. So feminist writers celebrated her patriotic tyrannicide and feminist rulers, uh, female rulers, I should say, not necessarily fem all feminists, female rulers identified with her. Um, Christine de Pizan saw her contemporary, Joan of Arc, who saved the French people, as a modern incarnation of the heroic Judith. And again, Artemisia's Florentine patron, Grand Duchess Maria Maddalena, celebrated Judith as her own prototype and even commissioned an opera to reinforce Judith's relevance to her own political agenda. Um, all that was very much in opposition to the steady eroticizing and negativizing of Judith that had appeared in early modern imagery uh, because she had entrapped Holofernes, seduced and decapitated him, so she appears often as a devious woman, a kind of femme fatale. So in the um, the Fizzi Judith, we're using this uh, to represent actually a composition she invented earlier in the Naples version of this picture, which is the Naples version has been cut down, and so you don't see really the full composition as you do in the second version uh, now in the Uffizi, which she painted on. Uh, because just to point out to people yeah. who, can, who might not know the Naples version, but you, you don't get the legs of Holofernes. Right, right. Find in the back. Um, exactly. So, and, I mean, yeah, go ahead, please. No, no, no. I was just going to say that, I mean, the other thing, because I think we sort of flashed by it that you might want to think about is how this composition compares to Caravaggio's, which she mm -hmm. clearly knew. Exactly. Uh, well, and, and it's important, therefore, to see the full composition, which is represented in the Uffizi version uh, that you see on the right here. Um, uh, she, uh, 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 Caravaggio's version on the left was something, a work she would have known in her years in Rome, uh, and she is clearly playing off it. She's uh, repeating the central aspect of its composition, which is the decapitation of the reclining Holofernes eye on the bed, uh, nude from the waist up at least. And uh, Judith, accompanied by her maidservant, is uh, cutting his head off, literally, as it, we see in Caravaggio as well, the parallel uh, position of the strong arms being essentially repeated in Artemisia's composition. Um, now, it's my opinion that, I mean, every, I pointed out this connection in the first book. It's, it's been out there for decades. Uh, and many people use it, in fact, as classroom uh, exercises to show uh, the starting, our starting point and the relationship between the artists. Um, it seems to me, increasingly, that she not only referenced it or used it as a starting point, but intentionally referenced it, the better to show him up, the better to compete with Caravaggio, because we know she competed with him even after he was dead. I mean, she was going on, he was her major influence, her major uh, starting point, stylistically and formally, but she thought she could do better. She had ambitions that were extraordinary for a woman artist of her period. She competed with Michelangelo, she competed with Caravaggio visually in art, and I've written about that too recently, but that is another subject. But let me just, you know, say a few things about this composition, this comparison. Um, first of all, Caravaggio's version uh, divides our attention between Judith, the assassin, and Holofernes, the victim of the assassination. He is given just as much attention as she, and the head maid servant is shoved off in the corner. An old woman is the stereotype of the crone who accompanies the young Judith. Young Judith is uh, rather dainty by comparison to Artemisia's rather strong, hefty, um, mature Judith. Uh, and of course, the other difference is Artemisia centralizes the composition so that, yes, Holofernes is at the center of it now, but he is on the bottom. The women are on top. It's a topos I view within the following chapter, the woman on top topos, which many, many women writers uh, and artists explored, um, and Artemisia does explore. But in the Judith, she's got the women doing the heavy work uh, intentionally, competently. You don't really believe that Caravaggio's Judith is capable of the execution given her 
delicate and almost squeamish response to what she's uh, uh, expression in, in what she's doing. Artemisia's women are uh, quite a bit that decapitating uh, ahead, and they do so vigorously. There's, it's more violent as well. They, each of them shows the, the head of Colophonese with blood spurting from the neck and blood spilling onto the bed. Artemisia does this with even more gusto. Uh, there's even more attention to the uh, splash of blood um, that spurts from the head of Holofernes. By the way, it was one a uh, couple of writers pointed out some years ago, the blood spurts from Holofernes' head in parabolic arcs derived from Gal Galileo's uh, if, uh, investigations of the period, which she would have known she knew Galileo. So uh, she outdoes, she outdoes um, Caravaggio in sheer violence, sheer uh, horror. Of course, the image, uh, the, then of course you see the bracelets on her arm, which were not present in the Naples version. She's brought this in, the bracelet, which shows little cameos that um, in my reading, at least um, allude to Artemis in one way or the other. And I, I've written that in the first book. I don't want to go into it now. I don't remember the details myself even, but they, they're there. At any rate, she brings in the Artemis illusion. Her own name, Artemisia, is related to, clearly she's aware of her uh, uh, identity with the Artemis identification, but also the Amazonian Association. And here we have to zoom out. Um, it, it's, by the way, not, not to leave the Caravaggio comparison, uh, it's, a, it's a stronger composition all the way around. Every student, every time I've ever put it up in the classroom, Students say, "My God, what a better what a better painting it is!" Uh, and I think it's not insignificant that Artemisia produced this better painting in Florence, the home of Disegno, where composition was particularly appreciated and admired. Um, and as a another um, sort of oh yes, you you see, so she wasn't afraid to show the blood and gold of uh, she actually relished it. Now. It's all the more shocking, and this painting shocked people. It shocked sub subsequent grand duchesses in Florence. They hid it. When I first saw the painting in the 1980s, I had to ask to see it because it was hidden away in the stairwell. It's now prominently displayed, but our grand duchess in the 18th century wanted to hide it away too. She couldn't stand the horror of the sight. Uh, Anna Jameson, the 19th century writer, complained about the horror of the sight. So it was shocking even to women. Why is it shocking? Not only the blood and gore, but it's a, an unthinkable image, two women killing a man. Women don't kill men in the, the patriarchal mythology. If they do, they get punished for it. Do the story is uh, one of the rare exceptions. Uh, yeah, you yeah, know, is in heaven. So uh, the assassination is uh, the, the killing of a man, this gender uh, androcide, I suppose we'd call it, is uh, um, unthinkable in patriarchal culture. Um, it, I, I think we, we might um, look at the pity, Judith, as a kind of a, a clarification of the political uh, associations with Judith. Uh, so maybe we could move, if, if uh, Francois, you don't mind, to the uh, other work of this period, uh, of Artemisia's Florentine period, the uh, so-called pity, Judith, because it's in Palazzo so pity, uh, where it, which shows art, another composition. Artemisia was very proud of the fact that she uh, she treated the same subject at different uh, in multiple versions of the same theme, but each time with a different composition, each time a different kind of uh, conceptual emphasis, if you like. Uh, the Judith, the pity, Judith shows. The two women, the maidservant, I should have mentioned earlier, of course, that the, the two women killing the man in the Uffizi Judith, one woman killing a man is murder. Two women killing a man is tyrannicide. Think of the famous uh, Harmodius and Aristogeiton uh, statue of antiquity, two men killing a tyrant. You kill a tyrant with two people, not one, multiple people. So the, here are the tyrannicides now standing side by side. Um, linked by not only by that unforgettable gesture of Judith putting her hand on the shoulder of her maidservant uh, in a clear a statement of sisterly solidarity, you might like. There are different classes. There are different classes are very much emphasized in their dress, in the composition. The maidservant is an attendant who carries the head. 
uh, Judas is the assailant who carries the sword, and yet they are united first in their reaction to danger, which is supposedly coming from the right-hand side, and in the significance and importance of their act. They stand in a dark space, almost like statues, and they are, in fact, statuesque for a reason, I believe, which is to say the multiple allusions to the agonistic drama that is taking place, that was taking place in the, in the Piazza Signoria. It's a specifically Florentine discourse. Um, Piazza Signoria was the uh, site of, uh, it's actually the background of uh, uh, Francois's uh, image on the screen, so you can see it in, uh, in a glimpse, but it was the site of a long-standing agonistic battle, as I call it, battle of the sexes. Uh, we begin with Donatello's Judith, a uh, uh, statue uh, created by Donatello in the mid-15th century, which was owned by the ruling Medici family, that of Cosimo Primo, uh, uh, the father of his country, not, not that Cosimo Primo of the 16th century, um, owned by that family. And it was once, a, when, when they were ruling Florence, a uh, civic emblem for the city. It stood, Donatello's Judith, stood in front of the Palazzo Vecchio. Um, it shows Judith killing a man, a very um, kind of you know, shocking image for some in its time, though it carried such heroic associations in the 15th century that uh, it was much admired. Um, well, the Donatello Judith was displaced in 1504 by the anti-Medici Republican government, who posi which positioned uh, Michelangelo's David in its stead. Um, uh, that was a political act, of course, uh, replacing the Medici with the Republican government and an emblem for it, but it was very much supported by a gender uh, bias, which is to say that a woman, as they had a little uh, meeting, a committee to uh, bring uh, Michelangelo's statue in and to discuss where these statues would be placed, and the uh, one of the participants in the dialogue said, this is 15-4 we're talking about, one said, well, we th he thought that the uh, uh, Donatello's Judith should be moved to some far distant site because it was a very dangerous uh, omen for Florence, with this image of a woman killing a man. It was not, not appropriate, so let's move it out of, out of sight. And of course, Michelangelo's heroic David, which needs no image to uh, bring it to your minds, uh, multiply uh, much larger and a man, uh, a male hero instead of a female hero uh, taking its place. Well, Donatello's Judith kept being displaced by new arrivals to Piazza Signoria. Uh, it was moved uh, first from a prominent arch in the Loggia dei Lanzi, um, which faces the square, to a more obscure corner. Uh, the new arrivals were, and we're not showing all this, but I'm, they're so familiar, I'm sure you can bring them to mind, Cellini, Benvenuto, Benvenuto Cellini's Perseus slaying Medusa and Giovanni Bologna, John Bologna's rape of the same Sabine women. Uh, which each in a different way celebrates a man or men brutally triumphing over women or women, all of which would seem uh, needed to suppress the horrific memory of Donatello's statue showing a woman killing a man, uh, which kind of got the whole thing going. Well, Artemisia comes along and this picture with its multiple allusions to uh, the, the drama going on in Piazza Signoria is very much part of it, even though it couldn't as a painting physically take place in the piazza. She, Artemisia reverses the power structure. Judith and uh, Barbara are now uh, unique heroines, uh, but the bunched drapery on Abra's backside, I'm sure you've noticed this by now, alludes directly to the backside of Donatello's Judith uh, with its uh, band of, of drapery pulling up the drapery, uh, the cloth around uh, the uh, body. Uh, the Medusa head in the basket is a reference to what happened in Cellini's uh, picture, but with the reverse roles of the severed head of uh, Holofernes in the basket, the man uh, killed by the woman, and the uh, on the ha haft of the sword, a Medusa head who screams almost mockingly at the head. Medusa has been redeemed by Artemisia in this way. Um, it seemed to me, and I think it's still true looking at it again, that, let me go to the head of uh, Judith, please, that the uh, Judith somewhat classicized profile and the bulging eyes recall Michelangelo's David, as does the cameo up on her hair. Uh, there we see a figure with a lance and a shield, 
very much like Donatello's St. George, which of course stood in the, um, or, or, or San Michele, not, not in, here, but St. George was uh, recognized as a kind of civic guardian of Florence, my, like Michelangelo's David, which was also seen as a kind of civic guardian for the city. Uh, so in Artemisia's imagination, Judith and Abra are replacing David and St. George as the heroic civic guardians of Florence. Now, perhaps not so much the guardians of Florence in the larger sense, the city that women couldn't vote in and didn't participate in politically, but the community of women imagined by her patron, Maria Maddalena, who I, I imagine was behind the commission of this. We know that she hung this painting in her private apartment in Palazzo Pitti, and it obviously meant something important to her. So uh, there you have, it, through Martimisha's eyes, at least this issue of political, uh, the political um, uh, issue for women. I didn't really talk about this, but it just very briefly, the, the, the argument against women's rule, women rulers, was that they lacked the men mental and physical courage to lead. Well, these women have plenty of mental strength and plenty of physical courage. Uh, feminist writers kept writing and asserting that if properly trained, women could be as strong as men. Uh, and could be capable political leaders too, if not more so. Elizabeth I of England presented one example in the real world. Artemisia presents another in, again, the fictive realm. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that <clears throat> Artemisia, of course, leaves Florence, uh, but the themes of women in power and women uh, on top, as it were, and women getting the better of men continue in another vein in her work once she's outside of Florence. So it's not really the Florentine political thing that she's showing, mm -hmm. but um, as the picture that we're looking at, at here, the um, Corsica and the Seder uh, show it within a very pastoral uh, way that relates to um, actually a kind of poetry I always associate with um, Mozart and the uh, fictive gardener that's usually translated in English, but the um, pastoral fado uh, kinds of ideas. And this is not really, I mean, it's a, in many, many ways, this is an astounding painting because the subject uh, is not terribly well known, but just looking at it, you have uh, a kind of visual sense of what is happening, that she is uh, escaping uh, the power of the uh, satyr who looks more like a man than perhaps a satyr in this. It could be a portrait, actually. Yeah, yeah, and of course you, I think, yeah, I, mean, I didn't mean to interrupt you, finish your, uh, your thought there. No, 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 I just, I, if, yeah. if well, you want to. Speak. Let me jump in then and, and just say, uh, explain the story for one thing. Uh, it's very much part of the painting, uh, Koriska and the satyr is part of a, is this one scene in a very popular pastoral play, a pastoral drama by Giambattista Guarini called Il Pastor Fido, the faithful shepherd. Um, and the, sh the plot of the whole uh, drama involves a lot of shepherds and nymphs, uh, pairs of lovers in conventional gender roles, and Coriska, who is a nymph, whose, nymph, whose uh, mischief drives the plot. Um, Artemisia picks this scene, it was rarely depicted, uh, and in which a lustful satyr who has been trying to capture and seduce Cariska for so quite some time, he finally manages to grab her by the hair, but her hair turns out to be a wig. So Cariska is able to escape, almost laughingly, as she pulls away from him and he's left holding, holding the bag literally, which in this case is the wig. Uh, so Cariska is perceived, presented by her, her creator, Guarini, as a duplicitous and manipulative woman a nymph who is a kind of female Don Juan, speaking of Mozart, she boasts of her many lovers and describes fidelity as a very fem foolish feminine vir virtue. She's a true villain, according to Guarini, but Artemisia shows her winning this contest of wits, and she's here exploiting the weakness of the satyr, his kind of dumbness in, in mistaking the, the wig for the real thing. So from a feminist perspective, perspective Cariska exhibits a kind of uh, extraordinary agency. She liberates herself from this man and from his values and the artificial values that take the shiny thing, the shiny object, the wig of the hair for the real thing. Um, now, as it happens, a lot of women uh, 
in this period, a number of them, I should say, wrote pastoral dramas. And she, they too fe featured nymphs outwitting satyrs. Um, Madalena Campigli uh, in a play called Flora, 1588, very popular play. Uh, Isabella Andreini in a play called Myrtilla. Uh, each of those has a, uh, nymphs outwitting satyrs and in the uh, little uh, motif of inscriptions on trees. One way we know that Artemisia painted this picture is when it was cleaned in a certain, oh, in the 19... Um, 90s, I believe, uh, that we, they found a, her, her signature on the tree. I can't really show it to you in this dim image, but uh, at any rate, she signed the tree, as did Pigus in the pastoral dramas by the women. So this, she, Artemis, this is the clearest example we have of Artemisia probably knowing the women writers of her time, and their work may have influenced her. Um, Isabella of Andreini, uh, her work published in 1588, a little earlier, but Artemisia undoubtedly knew her. She um, it was more well known in Florence, for one thing. But her daughter-in-law, Virginia, Ram Virginia Ramponi Andreini, uh, worked in Florence, and Artemisia possibly collaborated with her in her years in Florence. So uh, there's a, another a, a personal connection uh, to be made there. Um, and I should just add, too, that feminist literary culture in Venice um, was very rich in the later uh, the 16th century, there was a flowering of feminist writers in the Cinquecento of Venice, including um, uh, dramatists such as Gaspar Stampa, Tullia d'Aragona, or Terracini, who all ch challenged their male counterparts, uh, um, Ariosto in one case and uh, somebody else in another. Uh, so that their heirs were Artemisia's contemporaries, and I don't think I've had a chance to speak of the personal, possible personal connections Artemisia might have had. Would you, Beverly, would you like me to yeah. um, put that in at this point? Uh, but I think it's important to know that, um, I think you had uh, suggested that there would be, might be a question about this, but uh, the, um, the, the, first of all, the idea of a connection between Artemisia and the writers doesn't depend on direct influence. Feminism is something that comes out of women's experience. It doesn't have to be read about in a book. Artemisia herself uh, painted feminist pictures before she uh, could have come, but she learned to read well, for one thing. Uh, and she probably didn't read feminist treatises even after that. But there is a possibility she uh, was, you know, at least um, not more than one degree removed from uh, the leading writers of her day. Um, Lucrezia Marinella, for example, was uh, very much uh, known in Florence. Her writings on, on the, the nobility and excellence of women formed the foundation for the uh, equally important treatise on women by Cristofano Bronzini who uh, wrote this monumental treatise on uh, women uh, of his own time, bringing her up to date in Florence. He interviewed Martimasia, and we know that he did. He talked to her, and he very much could have introduced, he was a close friend of uh, Marinella, so they could have introduced them in Rome when they were all there at the same time at one point. Um, so she could not have helped almost, but know the work of, of uh, if not the person of, of Marinella. Uh, the other major writer, Arcangela Tarabotti, she who was uh, a nun in Venice, and both of them really were based in Venice. Um, she, uh, Tarabotti wrote her, her uh, explosive treatise, which she called Paternal Tyranny, from the convent. Um, now, Artemisia mean, went to Venice in, um, in 1627, spent three years there. Uh, it's never known why she went to Venice of all places. She didn't have any known patrons there. She had only, in fact, one patron uh, name is known all the time she was there, apart from the King of Spain who commissioned her from a bar. But the local, um, the only local patron was a man named uh, Giacomo P Pighetti, who happens to have been the brother-in-law of Arcangela Tarabossi, the, uh, the nun writer of Paternal Tyranny. Uh, and it's almost impossible they couldn't have met, really, even though she, uh, Tarabotti, conducted salons from her, uh, her, her cloister's uh, cell, and she was very much in touch with developments in Venice. So there's a possible connection there, which I hope someday someone will explore further. So she might have known these people. She could not help but have known the ideas of the time. 
um, because these are mainly the women who wrote treatises. They weren't the only women aware of feminist issues in their day and talking about them. So I think that we don't have to prove, you know, a kind of literary connection in any way, even though there might really have been one. Well, I went off onto that a little bit because I know you wanted to make that a point. Yeah, to I wanted up. to ask a, about that um, question exactly that you've answered. And we know um, that Artemisia moves around a bit after Venice, she, she goes to Naples, but then she's called to London. And the yes. painting that we're looking at here is actually a really interesting thing because I think that I grew up always thinking that this was a self-portrait. This is Artemisia showing herself as an allegory of painting. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think that, you know, here it's quite interesting because we've seen her embodiment in other kinds of paintings of self-portraits and we've seen her embodiment uh, in subject matters of bringing her own personal life in. But you don't think that this um, particular allegory of painting is a self-portrait, is that right? Well, no, no, I would never say it's not, that she's not in it. Uh, and the only, I think I'm involved in part, preceded by Michael Levy in connecting uh, our, our, the allegory of painting with this image and presuming that it was, as, at that time I wrote about this first in the 1980s, uh, we, didn't, we didn't know much about what she looked like. Uh, since then we've come to light, well, at least one major portrait has come to light, that of um, Simone Vu, a portrait of Artemisia, and it do doesn't look conspicuously like this image. However, I would never say she's not in the image. And I, in the, in the uh, recent book, the uh, book we're talking about today, um, I, I try to bring out the uh, possibility that she's not painting a literal self-portrait, but certainly she's in it. Um, and it's, it may well be a, more, a little bit more generalized about women artists, I would say, in general, because I think she's by this time quite well aware of her, her own heritage of Lavinia Fontana is a very important, uh, respected precedent for a successful woman artist. So Fenisba Anwisola's work, she probably knew too. So she's in a way constructing a kind of ideal uh, dynasty of women artists, if you like, which may or may not um, center on herself. And of course it works for herself. Uh, and that's how we've all come to understand it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't in any way um, reject that, that interpretation. The, um, when she comes to England, um, her father, who we haven't mentioned at all today, um, is uh -huh. painting in uh, England. And she, Artemisia, as far as we know, is asked by King Charles to come. Uh, what sort of degree mm -hmm. or influence her father might have had in that? She, at the time, we know, was working in Naples. But what is quite interesting is that the uh, major work that she starts out helping her father with uh, is really the conception of two female patrons. And mm -hmm. eventually, then you have a female artist directly in this case, a lot of cases we don't know who she painted for, but here's a case where you have two very strong females that are totally involved with the creation uh, of this work. Yes, uh, and you uh, summarize the uh, history in, 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 I think, the right focus for it, because uh, certainly it was Charles I who issued the invitation to Artemisia to come to England. And in fact, she'd been, he'd been trying to get her to come for several, uh, almost a decade before she actually finally picked up, picked up and went. Uh, she was always too busy, she said, with other commissions. Uh, but she did go, and uh, her father had been there for some 10 years in service to the court. Uh, but she very much, even though Charles issued the invitation, the whole uh, the, the Greenwich ceiling, which you're looking at here, uh, originally in Greenwich, uh, the Queen's house at Greenwich, Queen Henrietta Maria, the Queen of Charles I, was very much behind the commission of the whole, um, the, the Queen's house itself and the, the cycle of paintings and uh, art for it. Um, Henrietta Maria was the, probably behind our inviting Artemisia more than Charles in this case. Uh, so Henrietta Maria uh, took up the, the Queen's house had been commissioned, uh, created by the King's mother, Anne of Denmark, uh, who commissioned Inigo Jones to build a country house and for 
uh, her and her successor as, as queen to the king, uh, Henrietta Maria, both foreign queens, Henrietta Maria of France, the daughter of Maria de Medici. Um, the queen's house served as a kind of autonomous female court. And so uh, Henrietta Maria filled it with paintings and sculptures, commissioned masks and performances in this house. So it was uh, her, her domain, really. Uh, the allegory of peace in the arts here, you see the central scene uh, moved from Greenwich in the 18th century, and it's now in Marlborough House in London. And you should, if you're in London, I'll petition to get to see it more than just once a month when it's open uh, to the public for a tour of the house itself. Um, anyhow, uh, the um, project of this pro ceiling, uh, and I'm going to come to the identification of the characters, let's just hold the whole image for, for a moment. Um, is framed by rectangular scenes of muses. You don't see them in this scene. But in fact, every single figure in the ceiling is female. Now, it's a kind of clever instance of a fem feminist appropriation of the convention of allegories, which were all too often confining for women. Um, and the women are given agency here somewhat beyond their identity. The project was very likely inspired by the art patronage of Henrietta Maria's mother, Marie de Medici, she who commissioned the major cycle of paintings by Rubens in the Luxembourg Palace in Paris. Uh, Marie de Medici was now in exile, and she came to live at her daughter's court during just the years that Artemisia was there. Um, Artemisia writes in the letter, it's an important document, she speaks of working for both queens. She describes working for both Henrietta, the queen and the queen mother who she describes as her mistress. So she's calling them her patrons. Um, Marie de Medici and Henrietta Maria make, I think, a covert appearance in the ceiling painting and very likely played roles in the, um, the, the iconography. Um, Francois, you were rightly zooming in on the figure of peace at the center of the uh, composition who is holding a scepter. Normally, peace doesn't hold a scepter, and she has a laurel leaf, again, not a symbol of peace. It was very much in the interest of both king and queen to present an image of the Stuart court as a um, hotbed of peace and, and, and a victory, even though it wasn't at all, but that was political. I'll go down to the bottom now, uh, and then below peace, you see victory, again, a, a desideratum of the, the court, but the p victory unlike uh, her allegorical counterpart, wears a crown and carries, a, a, again, a laurel leaf, and she's got her foot on a cornucopia, probably all allusions to Henrietta Maria as both queen and progenitor of the, of the uh, her successors who, who would inherit the crown. So they're there, and to move to the left a little bit now, uh, that figure, uh, this is a figure supposedly representing reason, but um, she doesn't really have quite the right attributes for reason. She uh, holds a shield that associates her more with Minerva, looks like Minerva's so, uh, shield, um, which was depicted by Artemisia in a portrait of whom I think was, I believe was Anne of Austria, the uh, da daughter-in-law of Marie de Medici at the French court. Um, and she wears a helmet. So again, uh, Amazonian associations, they bring to mind Rubens' painting of Marie de Medici as Minerva Bellona, the goddess of war, uh, in the Luxembourg Palace. And so I think uh, Marie here brings herself into the iconography. Now let's move up to the left, a little bit further to the left, and a little bit so we get all the, these, whoops, the, these three figures in, that's right, that one, that one, and, and reason. Now we move a little further left and we see more allusions to another allusion to Marie de Medici in the very prominent one-breasted figure. Amazonian uh, imagery played an important part in the Luxembourg Palace. Marie de Medici had herself represented as an Amazon, the one-breasted icon of an Amazon. And so here she appears in a figure who is supposed to be rhetoric. However, none of the attributes are those of rhetoric. Um, interesting that uh, the figure of reason looks up at the figure of rhetoric. Uh, this figure wears a helmet again, not part of rhetoric's identity, and she holds up a mirror, again, not part of rhetoric's identity at all. Yeah, and then we can go back down to the figure she's holding the mirror to, who is supposed to be grammar. And this figure uniquely has the correct iconography. Now that's keeping the girl in brown here a little bit. There we go. She correctly is 
his grandma in the reap and iconography tells us is pouring water into a, a pot of flowers or plants to grandma nurtures the young mind to uh, think and do correctly but grandma is looking up to rhetoric supposedly although she's not really and she's wearing white not an attribute again of rhetoric and uh but another allusion does bring in rhetoric. She, rhetoric holds a sword, and grammar is holding a hasp on which the sword is being sharpened. Uh, that brings into play a metaphor, and I, I, I thank Sheila Barker for pointing this out to me. Um, the uh, Italian word aguzzare means both to sharpen a knife and sharpen a rhetorical point. So you see it's an interaction between rhetoric and, and the knife, but it also suggests an intimate relation between these two figures. And because this one is rather younger than the other, um, I suggested that it might bring a mother-daughter relationship into play. Uh, we might think, of, for example, of Henrietta Maria and her mother, Marie de Medici, who, uh, who are connected, of course, by their uh, family relationship. But it occurred to me that one of the themes that might have meant something to the two queens uh, here, the queen and the queen mother, was that of matriarchal succession because according to the uh, rules of um, in, in the patriarchy, uh, neither France nor England allowed for female succession, direct succession to the crown. You had to be a widow and come there temporarily. So neither one of them could ever imagine to pass on the monarchy to her daughter. So it would be in, in a way the strongest explanation for unifying the iconography of the ceiling, the allusions to uh, the, the points I've, I've mentioned uh, a way of connecting women across time and space, that the same thing that, that the women feminist writers wanted to do, and Artemisia herself. And if I can take just one moment more to point out, as I do in the book, that the mother-daughter relationship and the strange iconography given to rhetoric here might bring in Artemisia herself, who was, after all, the artist to bring and these figures to life. And she did paint oh, this whole group of figures. Um, Artemisia's own mother was named Prudencia, Prudence, and the iconography here, the woman holding the mirror, that's Prudence, uh, the iconography of Prudence. Artemisia's mother was named Prudence. She actually ascribed her own artistic uh, beginnings to her mother, uh, but her, she named her own firstborn daughter Prudencia as well. So we have Prudencia guiding the young Artemisia, or Artemisia guiding her own young Prudencia, uh, but it, it, it harmonizes with the desire for matriarchal succession uh, realized in the ceiling for, for the queens. And Artemisia did train her daughter in painting, had hopes for her probably at this time. She didn't turn out to be an artist after all, but um, that I would kind of bring it the, the um, collaboration between the queens and the artist together in the ceiling. I think that that on this note, it, it would be time to open the discussion to the to the audience. It, it's really a pleasure to listen to you. And so I would invite invite members of the audience either to use the reaction button and raise your hand and then I'll invite you to speak or simply to put a, a question through the <clears throat> through the chat. And then I, I will put this uh, this question to the to the speakers. Well, while while people are preparing their, their question, on the subject of allegories, uh, I think you, you very much point out that Artemisia is using the allegorical shape to assert her feminine presence and energy and intelligence in the context of a patriarchal world. I was wondering whether this idea of inhabiting allegory with real people is not one, something, one thing that would come from her knowledge of Caravaggio, because I think that's something he does quite often. I think, for instance, of the victorious love, where it's really a real person that poses as an image of love, which is also over in pose of her Michelangelo's victory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, Caravaggio certainly puts a real character. He's not anybody we know, however, he's just a young young boy in, in, in Rome that he uh, mm -hmm. put in the model role. Uh, I think more relevant probably is uh, Michelangelo and Caravaggio's habit of putting them, their own self-portraits in the imagery, not necessarily allegorical imagery, because they couldn't play that role allegor. That's one thing they couldn't do. Uh, Michelangelo is celebrated at Casa Bonarroti, the big apex of it all, but he has to be shown the allegory of a thing has to lead him up the steps because he can't be the allegory. So that's one almost advantage women had. Caravaggio puts himself self-portrait into uh, narrative paintings like the martyrdom of St. Matthew, I believe in the David and, and Goliath, but 
they they are uh, man, male artists unlike female artists are not consigned by allegory to being a type they, they can play with identity they can have complex identity but women have the are saddled with the uh, allegorical burden of they they have to rep represent things they can't actually do allegory of justice is a woman because women weren't judges so you know it's an allegory and not a person uh, so they, but then that kind of traps women uh, from being able to have agency in the world. So I think allegory works extremely differently for male and female artists, even though you rightly point out that the idea of a self-image in, a, in a, uh, an allegorical or historical figure is, is not a new idea with Artemisia by any means. And Caravaggio probably gave her the idea. Mm. Well, uh, reading you, one artist that, that comes to mind when you speak of the divided self is uh, Cindy Sherman. And do, do you have any, any comments on that? Because it seems to be such an extraordinary development of one of the approach of um, Artemisia. Yeah, I think there's a real uh, line between uh, the, the, the theme of women artists as role playing, like Artemisia does here uh, in the images we looked at and Cindy Sherman's uh, role playing, which is very much her, mm -hmm. her, uh, her theme. She presents herself in those uh, Hollywood stills as in different roles, uh, the housewife, the frightened uh, housewife or this or that. Uh, so, I, I mean, I wouldn't uh, say that Artemisia was a direct influence by any means, but I think this is part in the, of the spirit of a feminist response to stereotypical identity is to imagine yourself in a variety of roles so you can't be pinned down to any one of them. Uh, of course, Cindy Sherman, uh, in my view at least, uh, those images, once you put an image out there, you may mean it satirically, you may mean it critically, as she did, but you've got an image of a woman being frightened or something like that, and so you can't control how it's received. And I, certain, even at the time she came into prominence as an artist, I often wondered if she was really successful in, in presenting a feminist critique of this um, tradition and stereotype or partaking it in, in inadvertently. Okay, thank you. Well, I have, oh no, please, Beverly, if you, have, if you want to comment on that, and then there's a question in the chat, but please. Okay. I didn't, because one thing that uh, you were talking about earlier, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Caravaggio's Judith and Artemisia's Judith, and you said that Artemisia um, was very consciously trying to outdo Caravaggio. She saw herself as trying to, in a sort of one-upsmanship, but I wonder how much at the very same time it's a kind of family thing because of course her father uh, went head to head yeah. um, with Caravaggio as well and so uh, is yeah. that a kind of sense that she is one <clears throat> up for both herself and her family at that point? Yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, of course, uh, Ar Ar Arazio Gentileschi, her father, did have a dispute with Caravaggio, but they were colleagues and, and they, you know, it was kind of a rough and tumble society. I don't think he uh, really repudiated Car Caravaggio uh, in, in his working life. Artemisia may very well have met him. He died in 1610, at which point she was, oh, 17. No, wait, let's see. Um, what, what's 1610 plus seven, 17. But, uh, well, no, I'm still getting this wrong. At any rate, she she could have known him in her early life, uh, but it was her, his works that she responded to mostly. Um, so I, yeah, but I there could be a family uh, story there. We we don't have the details, but of course it's uh, it's possible. And I think it's interesting that you bring up that kind of dynamic within the Gen Gentileschi family. Thank you. I have a question in the chat from Alison Hall. Is it not possible to see in her work an appeal to the male gaze in the violence which shocked women and in the prominence of breasts and coyness of a fleeing maiden? Yes, there is, certainly it's possible to see it, and that has been seen many, many times. Um, Artemisia's work, uh, we didn't get into this in detail, but uh, the, the, her, pay, her known patrons very much appreciated and liked her paintings of female nudes, or semi-nudes or nudes, uh, Susanna, Lucretia, uh, Venus, and things like that. And we can assume, because of what they wrote about her, that they liked that they praised her female be the beauty of her female imagery, which kind of shades into you know, looking at naked ladies and, and liking it. Uh, so that there's that appeal. Um, Artemisia, must have been well aware of that appeal, and she 
in one sense, Capital has done it because she produced those images. But if you look at the Lucretia, which we looked at, it, it, you can't, if, you, if you're only seeing the luscious breasts, you're missing a whole lot of it. You're missing the point. Uh, so there was another kind of um, world to which those images spoke. The uh, one, the Carisca, the ones we looked at, this one. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's uh, there was a, there were two different audiences really for her work. Whether the feminist uh, perception of Artemisia, which has only been articulated in modern times, really uh, was full blown in her time, is something we can't really know. I tried my best to find out if there were any female patrons uh, of her work who had not been uncovered yet. Uh, I have not. I hope that that will be a project for someone someday, uh, further project, because uh, a number of her most outrageous paintings, the ones that we call the donna infame, the, the uh, dangerous women, the women who, the bad girls, as I call them, Carisco is a bad girl. Um, Delilah is a bad girl. Artemisia painted her and cuts off Samson's hair. Medea, who kills her children, is a bad girl. She painted her too. Um, and th these women, and Judith, of course, is always a little dangerous. She painted these, and there must have been dual audiences. There must have been men who, uh, uh, no matter what she said in the painting, prominently saw the box in the female nude. That, that dynamic went on when it, I first published on the uh, 1610 Susanna and, and gave it a feminist interpretation because this, this Susanna, unlike the, so many others, was resisting her sexual oppressors. Uh, there were male critics who insisted that but it's female bodies on display here, so it is a painting of a nude, no matter what you think. Well, female responders uh, g gave outrage one voice. If I wasn't unique in, in uh, <laughs> seeing the, the feminist voice there. Okay. Thank you. But, and, uh, yeah, oh, yes, 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 please. No, no, okay. it's just that there, there would, uh, it would, I don't think she was so self-consciously speaking in code, but it, 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 the result was the same. The, the uh, projection of, of values to do two different audiences and they were two different worlds in the time. Okay, thank you. One more question from Sonat Basu. So thank you for the very interesting analysis of the painting. My question is this, could you comment on the repeated depictions of male figures in Gentileschi's painting that are sleeping unconscious or dead? Can there be any reason for the profusion of such images apart from the requirements of the subject matter of the painting? Uh huh. Well, I think it, it stems, the image of the dead or reclining or sleeping male stems from the choice of the, of the theme, first of all. You might say uh, she wanted to paint a dead man, so she picked a theme. Probably not that way around, but it does have, of course, the consequence that we, the interesting point that you bring out. Um, I, I think it's <clears throat> very much a secondary consideration that she really didn't have direct access to the male model or wasn't supposed to. So. Um, depicting a figure uh, she, and her, her figures of male figures in action are not terribly convincing really. Um, so it, it may be that it was easier to paint a dead or sleeping man and to also to um, objectify him the way women had been objectified by men. Okay, well thank you. Well, no more question in the chat at the moment. I can slip my question. I was wondering, you explained that um, Artemisia was very connected to Italian academic culture. And my understanding of this culture is that it's a very rhetorical culture where you would write, for instance, a praise of Nero, or you would write in favor of women and against women. So in that world, is there some men who are actually allies of women? And asking myself this question this week, I looked at the, um, the Molière plays, Les Femmes Savantes et Les Précieuses Ridicules, and in Les Femmes Savantes, he seems to be quite in favor of women. So I have the sense that maybe there were some men who were thinking out of uh, stereotypes and were sympathetic to the, to the female cause. But what's your view on this? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought that out because we didn't really talk about the, uh, the academia 
uh, degli incogniti in Venice, uh, one of those acad academies, as you point out, where it was one of the uh, games that they played to take a subject and the the, uh, the woman question, as they called it. It was only a question because men made it a question, but the woman question was very much debated uh, in, a, in a kind of stylized way. There would be somebody designated to talk for women and then somebody designated to talk against women. Uh, Gian Francesco Loredan, who founded the Academia degli Incogniti, the Academy of the Unknown People, um, he uh, he played a major part in that academy, and his uh, he's been talk uh, he's been quoted his writings have been quoted about women, which are quite misogynist. They talk about women as dangerous uh, dangerous because of their beauty. They seduce men, they trap them, they ruin them. Blah blah blah. Um, but it may it has been suggested this may have been done in a rather ironic spirit because he was just playing a role in the academy uh, according to its structure. Artemisia, by the way, is invited to come and participate. She probably did. Um, so it may all have been in a kind of joking and playful spirit that these things were carried out. However, in the uh, when uh, push comes to shove, so to speak, uh, when uh, the, when feminist protest gets too strong. Um, he, uh, Loredan himself, uh, praised Artemisia's art and poetry he wrote to her and about her. He picked out only her, of her works only to talk about a Lucre uh, excuse me, a Susanna, a sleeping Cupid, and uh, self-portrait. Nothing that was threatening like the Judiths, which he might have known. And when uh, in Venice, he was the patron of, our, of Arcangela Tarabotti, the author of that the book she, the treatise she called Paternal Tyranny, but he suppressed its publication until the title could be changed to something like um, Innocence Betrayed, which tells you nothing of its feminist content. Uh, so you see, he was sitting on top of the lid of the feminist protest, even as he played a role in another way of diffusing the threat, of course, is to joke about it. So the whole satirical playing with the fem woman question theme was really not meant to, to take it seriously so much as to control it. Microphone. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any more question in the chat. So maybe it's time to say a, a very big thank you to you, Mary, and to you, Beverly for an hour and a half of a truly illuminating conversation on uh, Artemisia and um, early modern feminists. And thank you for everyone who has been there for your questions. Oh, I see something in the chat. Yes, uh, um, yeah, I think you've sold a copy of your book already. Um, someone who said really interesting talk. Thank you, I will definitely be getting your book, Mary. So thank you again, everyone. And uh, we'll see you uh, in October for another season of uh, Renaissance Lives. Good night. <laughs>